Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, maybe say that briefly. It's good to be back here again this evening. Um, the field of Boaz, the field of Boaz is a book that I, it's a book that I want to highly recommend, the field of Boaz, um, not just because it's been written by my friend and brother, but because I have read it uh, more than once, because I had a privilege to go through the book while it was in production, uh, before it went to press. It is a tale of God's redemptive power. Uh, it's something of an autobiography of some sort that has been woven around the narrative of the biblical Boaz and Ruth. Uh, in that book, you are going to see that God can redeem no matter what your background or your history might have been. You will see God delivering from abuse of some of the most unthinkable sort. Uh, you will see forgiveness. You will see reconciliation. You will see the power of love. You will see the beauty of marriage. You will see the enormous possibilities of consecration. And within those pages, you will also see God's ability to bring beauty out of ashes. Uh, it's a very well done book, like you saw with Reverend Dan. Uh, about 13 chapters, 177 pages. So it's not a very big book in that sense. Uh, 177 pages, 13 chapters. You will be blessed. I highly, highly recommend the field of Boaz. God bless you real good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And of course, those of you online, you've been sufficiently briefed on how to lay hold on a personal copy if you uh, want to get one. So literally wherever you are in the English-speaking world, I'm sure, there is a way to get a copy. Please, uh, get one for yourself. Get one for keeps. And get one as a gift for someone. That's my recommendation. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray again tonight. You that dwell between the cherubim, we ask that you will shine forth. Send forth your word. Lord, let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name and God's people say, Amen. Amen. Um, earlier in the day, I wanted to begin considering uh, a matter from Matthew's gospel in the 16th chapter, and it is to that exact um, chapter that I want us to turn, Matthew 16 from verse 13. The Bible says, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and some, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
And whatever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. All right, as you uh, look at the progression in this uh, portion of scripture, one of the things that come to mind is the way that Jesus Christ um, advances the question of his identity to his disciples. You would think that it was okay to say, okay, guys, what do people think? What do you know that people say about me? Who do men say that I am? That's perfectly legit. But for Jesus to be asking his disciples who they themselves say that he is, I found that a little bit disturbing because, as you can tell, this is the 16th chapter of Matthew. Several of these guys have been following him for quite a while. Are we to assume that they had followed Jesus without knowing who it is that they had followed? That as followers of Jesus, it was convenient for Jesus to be asking them, come, who exactly do you think I am? You would have thought that those are questions that should have been resolved before they began following. Like, you don't want to follow someone you don't know. And if you are following somebody, it should be safe to assume that you're following that person because you know the person. But Jesus Christ, uh, by reason of the passage we've read, gives us good reason to not make those kinds of assumptions. So that even as followers of Jesus, it might be important once in a while to take a pause and to have a personal redefinition, an assessment of your own personal position about the identity and the personality of Jesus that we all say that we follow. Hallelujah. Now, but as the story unfolds, you know, um, and then Jesus said, whom do you say that I am in the, in the 15th verse? Now, in the 16th verse, Simon answers, the Bible says, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This profession, I need you to hold on to this profession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This was the confession of Peter. I don't have the time to, anyway, maybe we'll touch a bit on it. So when Jesus says you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the Bible says that Jesus now answered, all right? And the answer of Jesus basically was to say, blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah, that means Simon son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed it or has not revealed it unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The confession of Peter here, I said, don't forget it. Peter had said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So what Jesus is saying is, you are blessed, and you are blessed, Peter, or, or Simon son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. It is my Father who is in heaven that has revealed it unto you. Notice that Jesus says, the way that Peter came into this understanding that is captured in his answer is by revelation. It's by what? Revelation. It says, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So, it also means that, whereas Peter came into this by revelation, he came into this by revelation from the Lord, because according to Jesus, by implication, the Father is not the only possible source of revelation. In fact, the first statement Jesus made was a negative. To say flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. As if to say it, it, it could have been flesh and blood. But right now, this is not flesh and blood. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. And the reason I'm teasing that out is because we are looking at built to last. 
If, if you are going to build something that would last, it's very important what the foundation looks like. And here, Jesus is saying, I say also unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, there could be different debates, but I mean, it's pretty obvious. The confession of Peter was what Jesus Christ was saying he was going to build upon. He was going to build upon. And that confession of Peter, therefore, is important for us to examine because it is a vital instrument, a, a vital resource, a vital commodity, if you like, if any building at all that will receive the approval of God is going to emerge. Jesus says, you are, you know, I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. it already you begin to say a couple of things about the building in context that Jesus builds and that there is foundation upon which Jesus builds and that even what Jesus builds will not be exempt from the attacks of hell. That even if it is Jesus that built a thing, Jesus is saying that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gate of hell cannot be said to either prevail or not prevail if the gate of hell is not going to combat it. But Jesus takes responsibility for the building. However, in order for Jesus to build, there was something Jesus said needed to be available, which was now available. And what that was, was what you might call a foundation. Because he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. What is the rock? The rock is a confession of Peter. What is the confession of Peter? The confession of Peter is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Are you there? Now, if you look at uh, John chapter 6 very quickly, um, because this is very important. John chapter 6, from maybe verse 68 for the sake of my time. All right? From 68, yeah. Then Simon Peter, so Jesus in John chapter 6 has taught quite a couple of things that people found very difficult, including uh, drinking his blood, eating his flesh, and all of that, the cost of discipleship. And at some point, uh, quite a number of people turned back, and they didn't want to follow him anymore. All right, okay. Uh, verse 66 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. Will you also go away? Will you also go away? Jesus was not willing to lower the standard just so as to have the numbers. Will you also go away? That's not because Jesus was not interested in people following, but Jesus was interested in having true followers. True followers. So he says to them, will you also go away? Verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art Christ. Thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Did you see what Peter said here? Same Peter in Matthew chapter 16, same Peter in John chapter 6. But what was Jesus' response to this confession of Peter in John chapter 6? Jesus answered, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now, what is the immediate correlation between, hmm, yes. huh, between you are the Christ? You are that Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response. Jesus' answer is, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. Ah. Sir, I just said that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you say, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the 12. This was how it went. Now, there's a way to arrive at how this would be a response. But I need you to see that it, it, that's not very obvious. Jesus didn't seem to make much. 
This was the same confession that Peter made in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus suddenly bursts out into this very profound privilege, uh, statement of privilege that he makes to, uh, uh, to Peter. And Jesus is saying, oh, you are Simon, bad Jonah, and you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. Blessed are you, Simon, bad Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. This is the point. It does look like there is flesh and blood revelation, and there is revelation that is from the Father. And it does look like what Jesus can do with both sources of revelation are different. Hello? It, you know, the thing that Peter said in Matthew chapter 16 was not the first time Peter was saying it. But the response of Jesus to Peter in Matthew chapter 16 was a new response. Peter said this thing before. But what Jesus said that time was, have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. Now, Peter says the same thing at another time and Jesus is blessing him. Blessed are thou, Peter bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. Almost as if to say the other time, you remember you say this kind of thing the other time, but that one was, it, it was the result of flesh and blood. You said it, in fact, in John chapter 6, I don't have time to deal with it. Remember that Peter was speaking on behalf of, um, it was like the result of the, it was a communique that came out of a committee meeting. He said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we know and we are sure, all right? That, and we believe that and are sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The point is, how many people was Peter speaking for here? When he's saying, to whom shall we go? And he's saying that we believe, we are sure that you are that Christ, the son of the living God. So you see that right here, Peter is speaking like on behalf of a team, on behalf of a group. He said, we believe, we are sure. Because, you know, the other time when we were alone, we discussed this, your matter. And we said, this man, we are even following. Let's vote now. Who, who, what do you think? about this man. And the consensus we arrived at is what I'm telling you now. We believe and we are sure. This, this corporate position became the matter. And Jesus said, in essence, <laughs> you believe, all of you believe. And you are all sure <laughs> that I am the Christ. Okay. Let me give you back-end information. I chose you 12. One of you is a devil. And you are here saying, we believe. Peter, leave this matter. When Peter came up the next time, and this time around, he was speaking because the father had revealed something to him. Jesus now brought him a blessing. First and foremost, minister, I need you to notice that. You can, hmm. oh, may God help us now. You can say things that look accurate and you can yet say them from the wrong place. Hmm? You can say things that look accurate and you can say them from where? From the wrong place. One of the problems with this kind of scenario is that an external personality will find it difficult to judge. Hey, so what has he said now that is wrong? What has he said that is wrong? We, that used to be the argument. Of course, these days, a lot of things are said that are wrong. But it's even possible to say things that appear to be accurate, but they are said from the wrong source. Let me tell you the import. The import is that, on the one hand, Jesus can build with it. On the other hand, Jesus cannot build with it. When you say things that are accurate and they are from the right place, Jesus can build on them. Are you with me? Jesus can build on them. But when you say things that appear to be accurate but from the wrong source, Jesus cannot build on them. Jesus cannot build with them. Remember, Jesus said, the words that I speak, in the same John chapter 6, the words that 
I speak. The flesh counts for nothing. Right? It is a spirit that quickens. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So, again, Jesus is not saying that words are spirit and life. That's not what Jesus said. He said the words that I speak. It's not everybody's words that qualify as spirit and life. The words that I speak. So, we can all say the same things, but they are powered by different realities. And depending on what powers, what it is that you are doing, there will be consequences. The consequences will be in keeping with the unseen reality that is behind it. It's wanting to have the right kind of words, the right kind of lingo, and to say all the, the normal things that should be said. The next thing would be what powers it. You see, truth, hey, Jesus, when, when, when Peter said, we know, we know, we believe and we are sure. We, we, we believe and we are sure. It was, he, he, this is the product of consultation. Consultation. This is consultation rema. Hello? This is revelation by consultation. And I don't want you to immediately misunderstand me or misrepresent me to be saying, therefore, that if you hear something somewhere, you cannot say it because you heard it from somewhere. That's not the point. We are looking at source. We are looking at source. Are you there? Jesus is saying that by the implication of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is saying that the thing you have just said does not have its source in flesh and blood. That's the kind of source I'm dealing with here. Flesh and blood as opposed to my father which is in heaven. That revelation can have their origin in the father. And revelation can have their origin in flesh and blood. The difference would not necessarily be in what he said. The difference will be in where it came from. What sponsored it. You could be you could be wrong because you said the wrong things. And many times that is the case. But there are occasions, occasional uh, 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 moments. There are, there are exceptional seasons where people might even appear to be, this, to be saying things that on the face are correct. Yet they themselves have not been inspired by the spirit of God. And the thing they are saying is actually powered by flesh and it is powered by blood. But that's not my focus. My focus is when Peter said what he said in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. But my father which is in heaven, we said that Peter came about that thing by revelation. Revelation is very important. I think it's in the same Matthew chapter 11, right? Verse 27. Is that it? Where Jesus says that nobody knows the Father except the Son. All right? All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Follow me, follow me, follow me. If you are going to know the Father, it has to be by revelation. And the person that will reveal the Father to you will be the Son. If you are going to know the Son for real, in order for you to cut anything in the world of reality, it has to be by revelation also. And it has to be by the revelation of whom? Of the Father. So the Father reveals the Son. The Son reveals the Father. When John therefore was saying that, and the word was made flesh and we beheld his glory, glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why was it that when the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, why was it not that and all beheld his glory? The we that John was talking about here is a select few that bowed the knee to Jesus because not everybody beheld his glory Glorious of the only begotten of the Father. Not everybody saw that he was full of grace and truth. If everybody did, nobody would have killed him. Are you here? Are you here? So there is a stream that I'm trying to bring to your consciousness. It is the fact that 
Jesus reveals the Father. He came to reveal the Father. And then Jesus turned around and said, the Father reveals me. Bottom line is, you cannot know God for real in any other way than by revelation. Revelation. And revelation from, from, from that standpoint is the unveiling, is the unveiling of something so that it might be seen and known for what it truly is. That's what revelation is, to reveal. In context means to uncover. It means disclosure. Are you there? So, so the way that you come into a true knowledge of God is by revelation. The way that you come into a true knowledge of Jesus is by revelation. The way that you come into a true knowledge of the Godhead is by revelation. If he is not revealed, he cannot be apprehended. So God reveals himself. God reveals himself. That's why the Bible says that when he hides his face, who can search him out? And the answer is nobody. So as ministers, one of the things that you would have noticed, if you are obtaining mercy from the Lord, is this matter of revelation. It is a fact that until God reveals himself, <laughs> huh? you will labor and labor and labor and nothing will come out of it. I normally say that nobody knows how to know God unaided. Hello? Nobody knows how to know God unaided. That is to say, without help, nobody can go out on a successful search for God, an adventure of divine search that will be successful. If anybody sought for God and they found God, God helped them. And whatever that help looks like, any day that it is withdrawn, even if you had made success and you have profited in this enterprise for 20 years, for 70 years, every other single time that you come, the same mercy must be extended unto you, otherwise you will languish in darkness. No man knows the Son except the Father. And nobody knows the Father except the Son and he to whomsoever the Son chooses to reveal him. And that him is the Father. The only one who knows the Son is the Father. The only one who knows the Father is the Son. And then other people might come into a knowledge of the Father if the Son chooses to reveal the Father to them. The thing I want to impress upon your heart as ministers is this matter of revelation first and foremost. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. To say to you, sir, to say to you, ma'am, that if you are going to continue to be, uh, 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 to, to be in the heart of God's calling for your life in ministry, it's going to be dependent on this ongoing mercy of revelation. When you come to the point in your life and in the, in the practice of ministry where you have become so used to doing the things that you do that you can now do it even if God is present or absent, you are dead. Some people have mastered the art of pulpit speech that they don't need God anymore. So, you know, we've been doing this thing for 40 years. Uh, we, we, we have learned the ropes. We know how to go about it. Every single time, a genuine servant of God is angulated, angulated in the posture of a seeker of the mercies of the benevolent God. Because any day that he chooses not to come, you will be stranded. A man that is no more stranded in such situation is a lost soul. Is a lost soul. And apart from that, you will become a waster of the life and the time of other human beings. Because people may gather onto you because you happen to seem to have something to say. And you may even say a lot of things that might titillate the mind, titillate the head, and that might inspire the soul. But the, in the final analysis, everything that you say under such conditions will be things that will have no eternal value because the Father will not be able to build on it and will not be able to build with it. 
any revelation that does not have its origin, its root in the Father, the Son cannot build with it. When Peter finally arrived at this rema, if you like, at this revelation, that ah, Jesus scrutinized this one and said, yes, yes, you got that from my father. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this one unto you. Ah, but my father which is in heaven. Then Jesus now started to say to him, now you are also Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this pronouncement that you have made, I will build my church. This pronouncement is not only accurate, it's not only true, but it was revealed by my father. That which is revealed by the father is that which I can build upon. When you gather people and you are dishing uh, flesh and blood rema, flesh and blood revelation, no matter how nicely packaged it might be, I'm saying that it lacks the power in the spirit to actually change the life of a people. This is why many times you notice, you, you watch some movement, some, you know, and it looks like, but they are saying the right things. Yet, in Generally speaking, the lives of the people are not a reflection of the kind of thing you think that they are being taught. It's because good information is not enough. No, good information is not enough. Jesus says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And it is a spirit that quickens. All words are not equal. So, so there are words that the Father inspires. And when those words are uttered, the Son can build. The Son can build on it. Otherwise, it will end up as a head exercise. What I call a head exercise. Your head will be full and bloated. Your heart will be hollow. Are you there? Your head we be full. And you can even be over yourself. Because your head is stimulated. But your heart is caused by darkness. Ever learning. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sometimes the problem is because the men that are throwing these words around. Those words are not words that have the imprint of the Father on them. Therefore, even when it seems like they are saying good things, it still looks like the good things are not producing the desired effect because Jesus cannot build on what you say until the source of what you say has been affirmed, verified to be the Father. Because this one is sponsored by my Father, which is in heaven, I will build my church on it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For a moment, I want you to lift up your right hand. Say, oh Lord, whatever you do, don't hide your word from me. Don't hide your face from me. Open my ears. Incline my ears to hear your word. Open my eyes to see your ways. Touch my heart to understand your precept. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's a good prayer to pray. So Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my father which is in heaven. And now tells him, you are Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, step two. What is the rock that Jesus says he was going to build his church on? It was a confessional of Peter. What was the confessional of Peter? It was what? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Is that okay? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So, 
the, the, the building in context, the building in context is founded upon this confession. And the confession is Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation upon which the builder builds. Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build. So that means this confession you have made is the foundation upon which I build my church. And it's very obvious. I don't think I need to convince you about that. The, the church has no other foundation than Christ Jesus. Is, is that not simple? Isn't that straightforward? Hello? Is that not straightforward? The reason for all of this labor is to continue from where I stopped earlier in the day, which is that we have not so learned Christ. And I said, why is it important for us to so learn Christ? So we begin to connect the dots so that we can make progress. It's important for us to so learn Christ because Christ is the foundation. It's the foundation of the edifice of life in the spirit is a foundation of the edifice that is the church is a foundation of the edifice of any life or ministry that will be acceptable in the sight of God it is Christ and you cannot have any building that is worth anything without a foundation so Christ is the foundation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from about the 8th verse all right in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from about the 8th verse, the Bible says, Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Okay? For we are laborers together with God. You are God's farm. That's what husbandry means. Agricultural, agricultural language. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Two metaphors that I use here. Number one is agricultural. The other one, number two, is what? Architectural. Agricultural, you are God's farm. Remember, he has been talking about one person plants, another person waters, God gives the increase. Isn't it? Yes. And he said, neither he that plants nor anything, you know, but God that waters, and in the end, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He's been using this agricultural language. So he concludes that by saying that you are God's Husbandry, that means you are the field, you are the farm, but you are God's farm. We have only been privileged to labor within this farm that belongs to God. Then he changes the metaphor and says you are God's building. He's basically trying to say the same things as it were. He's just using different metaphors to say it. So one of the metaphors he uses is agricultural. The next metaphor he's transitioning into is what? architectural. And so he says, you are God's building. This is a, an ongoing theme all through scriptures. The, 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 the metaphor of building, representing either God's people as a corporate entity or representing God's people as individuals. Your body is the temple of, of God. You are God's temple. God dwells in you by his Holy Spirit. In John chapter 2, Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And they say, do you know how long it took for them to erect this temple? They were not aware that he was talking about the temple of his body. Hello. Hello. Yes. And the Bible says, you are God's temple, and you should not defile your body because it is God's temple, and anyone that defiles it, God will destroy. The language, the temple language is... Is, is ubiquitous through scripture. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Now, Paul employs the same metaphor. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Paul says, you are God's building. Next verse. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Remember? He says, you are God's building. And according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, therefore I have laid the foundation. Because of course, every building begins normally from where? Foundation. So now he transitions and he's developing now this architectural language. I have laid the foundation. 
and another built their own. That means another person is building on this foundation that I have laid. And another builds their own. But let every man take heed how he builds their own. Okay? For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I want you to answer that one more time. Which is a final time. Which is? Jesus so again, we have in clear language that the foundation is Jesus Christ. So when Peter said the other day, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, yes, it is upon this rock that I build my church. I said the rock is the confession of Peter. And what is the confession? Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, upon it, and we build my church. Now, explicitly in this passage of scripture, we have been told that the foundation is Jesus Christ. So, any building that will have a future must be founded accurately. And the accurate way to, for such a building to be founded is that it is founded upon Christ Jesus. Number two, it gives you an insight into one of the core assignments of the apostolic. One of the core assignments of the apostolic is to establish foundations as a wise, according to the grace of God that is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. Again, I don't have the energy, the, the time actually, to, tease, to break all of that open tonight. But he says, it's the grace of God given unto me. And that grace is given to me as a wise master builder. A wise master builder. That was Paul talking about himself. But having called himself a wise master builder, he goes on to tell us what his labor was as a wise master builder. And he didn't say, as a wise master builder, I have built. That was not immediately what he said. What did he say? I laid foundation. Sir, you went through all of this route to call yourself a wise master builder and in the end, the, the entire thing is you laid foundation. Wise master builder. Foundation. Everything else rises or falls on the integrity of that labor. That is the true essence of true apostolic ministry. To establish foundation. And that was why the thing I was saying to you this morning, even though some of you were revolting in your heart, we didn't have the time. Now you see what it is that the apostolic does. He said, I have laid the foundation. And what did he say about that foundation? He said, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So when he said, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. He tells us what that foundation is. And the foundation, according to him, again, is what? Jesus Christ. So, if you are an apostle, this is supposed to be the highlight of your ministry. In terms of content, there are other components of the apostolic that are not necessarily expressed in words. It's a DNA. And there are possibilities that come with that DNA. But in terms of the content of the apostolic, it, it, is, it is too late to innovate. It's too late. The lines are so etched in scriptures, too obvious, too apparent, too deep for anybody to want to revise them now. The job of the apostolic huh, is foundation laying and the foundation is Christ. So, uh, Jesus, please permit me to use this language. The, it means that the, the merchandise that the apostle brings to the market to sell is Jesus Christ. His assignment is to walk Jesus into the lives of people as they base 
upon which everything else that they will have, that they will be in life, will be founded. That's what the apostle does. Other people might come and build on it. Are you there? Hey, you can put on the superstructure. You can decide this is going to be a glass house eh, predominantly. Or we are going to use acacia wood to do this, whatever. Oh, our window is good. Other people can build on it. On it. And what other people build on it might even be usually more visible. But the foundation is sacrosanct. And the man said there can be no other foundation than that which is laid already, and the foundation's identity is Jesus Christ. So the question is, apostle, 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 do you even know Jesus? Because in the language of this scripture, okay, that is what you are supposed to be realizing in the lives of people. You know, in Nigeria, they will say, now waiting person the carry come market, they sell. The idea is that what the apostle brings to the market is Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Hola, Mohofa. Are you with me? That is why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, popular passage of scripture, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the what? The apostles. And prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So you see that the apostolic ministry is a foundation ministry. Foundational. And the identity of that foundation is not shrouded in any mystery. It's not open for debate. This is not the area where you can say, hey, you know, God gave different people different things. Let everybody focus on the one that God gave them. It, the matter has been sealed concluded in scripture that the merchandise of the apostolic is Christ Jesus. He, he has no other way that he brings to the market. There, there is nothing else that he brings to the market to sell. If it is apostolic, his primary, major, central, unique ministry is the working out of Christ Jesus as foundation for lives, for ministries, for peoples, for saints. Paul said, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid already. So if anybody comes 2,000 years later, hello, hello, if, if, if anybody comes around 2,000 years later and they have become a apostles of GNLD, or I don't know what the teachers people are selling these days, or the person is now the apostle of money. Hey, in the beginning it was not so. It was not so. And the command is not to move the ancient landmarks that the fathers have put in place. We are not saying that there are no other things that people can do. We are simply saying that other things are not apostolic. Call it what it is. Are you with me? Because with regards to buildings that will last, we need to deal with foundational issues. And the foundation is Christ Jesus. That's the focus. I'm not teaching on the apostolic ministry. It just implied. The ministry of the apostle is a ministry that traffics in foundation laying. Therefore, the apostolic ministry is foundational. I'm not sure you got that. The ministry of the apostle is a ministry that is saddled with the responsibility of foundation laying. Therefore, the apostolic ministry is a foundational ministry. So you see that there is a sense in which it feels like, you know, we are the guys, we are the people, you know, everybody wants the, the, they have some eloquence. All right? We'd imagine that they have become apostles. But in reality, the assignment of the apostle is foundational. It is foundational, it is fundamental, and it is foundational because everything else rises or falls on the labor 
that is truly apostolic here. So, the identity of the foundation that the apostle lays is Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in his own words that he will build upon a rock and that rock was Jesus, the son, Christ, the son of the living God. Paul tells us that he is laid foundation and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses a matter may be established. We're going somewhere. So if the foundation is Jesus Christ I want us to look at what Paul says here. Back to our passage, 1 Corinthians. Okay. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, do you see it now? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, Stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. This is very troubling. Part of why this is troubling is because he didn't say every man's work is obvious. He says every man's work shall be made manifest. Almost as if to say nobody knows any man's work until a certain day in the future. Uh-uh. It's something that we are all seeing like this. They say, no, you are not seeing. <laughs> you are not seeing. Because, hello, there is a material science that is required in order to be able to ascertain the true nature and value of people's work. And the tools of that scientific inquiry they are not available today. Hmm? They are not generally available today. It does not mean that they, you can't chance upon them. You can, particularly for your own personal labor. You can. And as you work with the Lord, it's possible. But generally, they are not everywhere for everybody to pick. That was why I said some of the things I have said previously. So this man is saying you can build with gold, you can build with silver, you can build with uh, stone, you can build with hay, you can build with wood, you can build with stubble. And then he says that every man's work shall be made manifest. Let's get back to it. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. So there is a day that is going to declare people's works shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Not size. Sort. Not size. Sort. Of what sort, not of what size. They already gave us an idea of the sort that your work can be. It can be gold. It can be silver. It can be stone. Are you there? Precious stone. It can be wood. It can be hay. It can be stubble. The problem here is that you will not know what the work, what sort the work is until that day. That means that if you see gold today, and you see wood beside it, you will know the difference. That's what the Bible is saying. You don't understand. The Bible is saying, otherwise, excuse me, do you need to wait till the future if they put gold here and they put grass here? Do you need to wait till the end of time to be able to say that these two things are not the same? No. But this is a spiritual quality assurance examination. And the medium for running that test, according to the scripture, is fire. It's a fire test. That there will be a lot of hay and stubble and wood masquerading like gold. 
And a lot of people will accord to them the value that should be accorded gold in time. It's only when we get there that day and they drop the thing into fire. When you see the way the matter reacts in fire, that's how you will know for the first time that this was not gold. And you'll be like, hey, we paid premium for this thing. Say, sorry. It was stubble. Is the, is this was supposed to be what you gave goats and sheep to eat. Stubble, grass. He, we were cheated. We were cheated. However, that's still not my focus. We are looking at building. Do you realize that Paul is using these materials to designate superstructure? Superstructure is what is on top. That is to say, the foundation is sacrosanct. If you don't have it, you have nothing. But if you have that foundation, it now we can now come at the thing you are putting on top of that foundation. It can be solid, it can be durable, and it may not be solid, and it may not be durable. But the thing that is sacrosanct first is what? Foundation. So, Every man's work, what sort it is? Let's, let's read on. I need to show you something. If any man's work abide, which he has built where? Thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Oh, Jesus, open our eyes. If any man does what? Abide, which he has built thereupon. What is thereupon? Which he has built on top of the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. If any man's work abides or survives or endures that they have built on top of this foundation, that man will receive a reward. Let's go on. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. You know why? Foundation. What he put on it did not survive, but he had it. He had the foundation. The problem was what he put on top of the foundation. This is why when we shout sometimes, people think that we are, I don't even know. Maybe people think we don't have work. People think we are jobless or we are jealous or we are. It is not it. Sometimes I cry. I tell you the truth. You know when Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of God, we persuade men. Listen to me. If you do not have foundation, you have nothing. You have nothing. We cannot talk about you suffering a loss. If you don't have foundation, if there is no foundation, there is no you to suffer any loss. You are gone. If you have the foundation, you can be saved and you are saved empty-handed. Hello? You, you can drop into heaven scarred. You can even drop into heaven as it were, homeless. <laughs> I'm speaking metaphorically, so don't misunderstand me. But you, that, that means that you can drop into heaven empty-handed. The Bible says the man will suffer what? Loss. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by, as by fire. So he lost everything that he put on top of the foundation. But he had the foundation. And that was his guarantee to eternal life. But he comes into eternal life empty-handed, no reward whatsoever. But he himself is saved. And Paul said, according to the grace of God that is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Do you see that? If you miss out on the foundation, you can have nothing. Nothing. Because in the end, there is no creativity that is allowed with regards to foundation. It's sacrosanct. Eh, 
know, superstructure, you can try gold. If that's too expensive for you, you can use silver. If that's too whatever for you, you can use precious stone. Believe me, any of those three items that you use, you will get a reward. Things start to get bad after precious stone. Where you now have what? Wood. You have hay. You know hay. That's dry grass. <laughs> huh? That's dry grass. Hay. You've heard the language, make hay while the sun shines. It's dry grass that you prepare so that you can feed your animals when the rains are over during the dry season so that there can be something for them to eat. So the first three, you can survive on them with reward. The last three, or the last three, they all are fuel for fire. They drop into the fire, the fire will just, it is a fire that will prosper. <laughs> and, and the fire will prosper at your expense. So, with the superstructure, you can do gold. You can do silver. You can do precious stones. Is that okay? That is the acceptable range. Profitable range for eternity. And then there is the unacceptable or the unprofitable range, which is wood, hay, stubble. However, any of these six items that you bring has to have been brought on one reality. With that reality, there is no alternative. If you miss it, you miss all. Nothing else matters if the foundation is not correct. And that foundation is what? Jesus Christ. If you are still here, say amen. amen. So, what we talk about, Jesus being the foundation, practically, therefore, in this building that must last, what are we talking about? You know, Jesus, on, during the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew chapter 5, uh, by the time he was bringing the Sermon to a close, he said, anybody that hears these sayings of mine and does them, it's like unto a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. Isn't it? He builds his house upon a rock. And this house upon the rock was such that after a while, the rains came, the winds blew, and the storm beat at it. And he says that the house stood still because it was founded upon a rock. The, the thing was built to last. And the reason why it stood was because of the foundation. It was founded upon a rock. The Bible says uh, it laid the foundation on a rock. And when the floods arose and, st and stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded Upon a rock. Now, the alternative, the second option is this. All right? Next option is that. Hello? Is there any verse? I was looking for the Matthew account in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew account. Matthew chapter 7. Please, find the Matthew account for me. He that heareth and doeth not. Okay, we can work with this. All right. And the rain descended and the floods came, yes. And the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. 26. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. What happened? And the rain descended just like before. And the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And it fell and great was the fall of it. Do you know that the only thing that was in focus here is how the house was founded? One house was built upon a rock. The other one was built upon a sand. And in the end, that was all that mattered. Whether one house would last, whether the house would last or not, in the face of the harassment and the barrage of the elements that we come at it, it will depend on the foundation. Almost as if to say, he, 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 the superstructure is not the most important thing. Are you with me? 
Even if you built with gold, but you built on sand, it has no future. If you built with silver and you built on sand, it has no future. Because they were not particular about the superstructure. The foundation was what mattered. And that was what made all the difference. Both houses got visitation from the same element. The wind. Are you there? The flood. The rain. It, it hit the one on the rock. It hit the one on the sand. The rain. The one on the rock. The one on the sand. The wind. The one on the rock. The one on the sand. What made the difference was not what they faced. It was their foundation. And I want you to realize that no matter how beautiful that edifice is, it, it cannot avoid these elements. The rains will come. However long it takes, the rain will come. However long it takes, the flood will come. However long it waits, the wind will blow at it. And on that day, what will matter will be foundation. I hope it's, it's very clear now. The kind of emphasis that I'm trying to put on this foundation for this building. So, when the Bible tells us that that foundation is Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ, the next question, therefore, is, practically speaking, how is Jesus' foundation? If a man wants to say, I want to make Jesus the foundation of my life, what does that look like? What, what does it mean? How do you go about it? Even when Paul was saying, as a wise master, according to the grace of God given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. What, what is that kind of exercise? What's that enterprise? How is it done? How is it done? We can begin to trace the answer to that question by holding very dear to our heart the answer to a prior question, which we have established. And that prior question is, what is this foundation? And the answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. So when we are now talking about how do you lay the foundation, we are literally saying, how do you lay Jesus? We are saying that, how, how do you establish Jesus in the lives of people? Earlier in the day, I was talking during the Q&A that there's such a thing as your formational discipleship, and there's such a thing as your manifestational discipleship. Okay? You can, be, you can be trained, you can be discipled so that you will form properly. And you can be discipled so that you will manifest properly. Manifestational discipleship is like the superstructure. It's the obvious thing about your life. So you see somebody say, ah! That guy is an accountant. You have not met an accountant like that guy. All right? That is your horn, the horn. That is a visible thing about your life. Or you say that guy is a consummate architect. Or that guy ah, is one of the best teachers. Teachers you would ever meet. If that, no matter who you are, if that man teaches you mathematics, you will get it. Are you with me? Now, there are superstructures. There are superstructure issues. And there are foundational issues. The foundational issues are the things that I refer to as formational. That's where you are formed. The superstructure is what I refer to as what? Manifestational. So that sometimes, are you with me? The problem with our discipleship model many times is that, especially as ministers, many ministers do not distinguish or differentiate between foundational and manifestational. So, they see both as a continuum and they want to compel everybody under them to fit into their particular mode on both aspects. Or in both aspects. How do I mean? Foundation. Remember that we have been told that for foundation, there is no difference because there is no other foundation that anybody can lay other than that which is laid already. Is that okay? But when it comes to superstructure, there is a, an allowed latitude for diversity. You can do gold. You can do silver. You can do precious stones. So I'm saying that with the superstructure, there is a latitude. So you can build a glass house. You can decide to build a wooden house. Use some very exotic wood to do your superstructure. That's physically speaking. Is that okay? 
I hope you are translating my metaphors accurately. Hello? Uh, because I don't mean wood in the spiritual sense. I'm trying to explain diversity to you. That's what I mean. So you can do superstructure with different material. What that means is that when you see a house, the first thing that strikes you will be different as to when you see another house. But they will share something in common. That thing is supposed to be their foundations. It's just that the foundations is, are not the things you see immediately you look at the house. That thing you don't see immediately you look at the house is supposed to be uniform for all of us. Even though what you see immediately you look may be different. So the problem is that many times, especially as ministers, and that's why that question that they asked, somebody asked about, is it only pastors that are supposed to be discipled or fathered? is a very important one. Because the problem many times is that ministers of the gospel disciple people both foundationally and what? Manifestationally in keeping with their own frame. You lay Jesus, if you are doing it well, you lay Jesus as foundation for people and then you lay pastor as superstructure for them because that's what you are. Meanwhile, your being a pastor is not foundation. Are you with me? Are you with me? It's the same way that in a household, you may have six children and then there are values that define you as a family. There are values. Say, this is who we are. In this household, we don't tell lies. Are you there? In this household, we are not dishonest. In this household, we are not immoral. In this household, we are not disrespectful. This, it doesn't matter who you are. These are the attitudes. These are the values. These are the idiosyncrasies. This is the philosophy of life that we uphold as members of this family. That's foundation. For example... Then, manifestation is child number one. You're an accountant. Child number two can be an architect. Child number three can be a historian. Child number four can be an apostle of the gospel. Child number five can be a teacher of the word. Child number six can be a barrister. But all of us, we hold the same values that define us. So that when you meet the barrister in court, you can tell that he comes from this family. Even though he is, do, he is lawyering. Are you, are you with me? Even though he is lawyering, you can tell that he is from that family. It, it, that was what they said about, about Mordecai. They said, if Mordecai be a Jew before whom you have begun to fall, you shall not prevail against him, but thou shalt surely fall before him. It doesn't matter whether he's a gatekeeper or whether he's working as a messenger or if he is a Jew. Foundation. DNA. Are you with me? So, you have a situation therefore where you will have there are certain churches where you cannot be an evangelist. Because the leader of the work is a pastor. So, the only approved designation huh? is pastor. That's, that's the only thing you can be. And I say, how is it so? You, you, you have four children and all of them are not pastors. Your biological children are allowed to diversify into different aspects of endeavor. But we do not realize that the same thing obtains spiritually. That there is the foundation and there is the variety there is a latitude allowed when it comes to superstructure matters. So that a pastor, like, look at Nehemiah. Not Nehemiah. Look at Mordecai. Mordecai was the one that raised Esther. Are you with me? He raised Esther and prepared Esther for the palace. Are you there? I remember uh, 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 William Wilberforce. One of the most important arrowheads that labored for the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. He was so passionate about God. He was a believer. I'm sure, I hope you know that. That the thing they did, the campaign against slave trade was not just political. He had a strong praying team. Oh yes, because they knew it was, it was also a spiritual issue. 
but was not all to be fought from behind the scenes. So when he was telling his pastor about his ministerial whatever and all of that, and he was showing the zeal, the pastor told him that his pulpit was in politics. You know, sometimes if we see anybody that is showing a lot of zeal, automatically we conclude that we have seen ministry material. Ministry material. If you can quote scripture, ah! We have seen pulpit ministry material. And so we want to beat them into the mold of what we are. So there are some places that you go, everybody is a prophet. Because the leader of the work is a prophet. Are you there? There are some places you go, if, if you are not a teacher that teaches in a particular way, it's not just what you are saying. It's how you say it. You must gesticulate like the leader. If you don't do so, you are out of order. In such a house, nobody will tell you. It's not as if they will say it, but you yourself know that there's no allowance for evangelists in this house. You will know it. That there's no allowance for evangelists. If, if something happens and you start to lift your voice to laugh, they, they, they will tell you to. I have, seen, I have seen Pentecostal setups where 70% of the members don't speak in tongues. And they are supposed to be Pentecostals. Huh? I have seen Pentecostal assemblies where almost nobody exists who knows how to cast a demon. On paper, they are Pentecostal. In words, they will say they believe all the things that you and I believe. But in practice, the only thing that happens there, no, sorry, you hold mic with the right hand and then you strike the word with the left hand. If you deviate from that pattern, you will be unofficially blacklisted. You know the way they blacklist you unofficially? Oh, Hello? You don't know how they blacklist you unofficially? The way they blacklist you unofficially is that you will be unofficially blacklisted. <laughs> hey. ah. you, will, you will never, never be given a chance. Alright? Because they don't want you to embarrass the system. There, there is something that has been set up that they don't want you to disrupt it. So you will have people laboring under migraine and asthma and arthritis and glaucoma and there will be sons in the house over whom God has dropped grace to deal with these matters within the body. But because they don't strike in a particular way, they are stifled. We have mingled and mixed up foundation with superstructure. Formation and manifestation. At the formational level, all of us must have the same. Are you there? But at the superstructure level, there is room for diversities. And it is a job of every father in the Lord to be able to discern his children. It's a job of every leader to be able to discern his people. It is a job of every pastor to be able to discern the members of the assembly that God has given you privilege to oversee. To be able to say, like the pastor of Wilberforce said to Wilberforce, you are not for the pulpit. Your pulpit is not in church. Imagine what history would have been like if Wilberforce's pastor had encouraged him into pulpit ministry. You will not have known of Wilberforce. I tell you the truth. You would not have known of Wilberforce. 
he had the foundation. So even when he went to do politics, all right, and he was in the, uh, uh, the, the legislative uh, thing that they do in the United Kingdom, he had a, a band of prayer warriors in Nigerian language. He had a team of prayer people that they met regularly to pray. He himself joining them regularly. That's what I mean. And even when he couldn't, there was a band of praying people behind the scenes that were laboring for his own labors and campaign in the political space. Because a pastor knew that as solid as you are, you are not necessarily pulpit material. Sometimes we think that all of the most spiritual people in our midst are supposed to end up on pulpit. And then we send all the unserious people into politics. That's why they are giving God a bad name in the Senate. Because we think that if somebody is, is showing zeal, ah, we recruit him for ministry. We recruit him for the pulpit. That's what I mean. Pulpit. Because we do not make these distinctions. So there are some of you, there's a rumbling in your spirit. But every time you come into your space where you people meet for fellowship, it, there is something, it's, it's as if, hello, it's as if you suffer nightmare. Have you had those experiences where it's as if something is pressing on you? And sometimes, even to, to, to open your mouth and shout Jesus, you can't frame the word. Have you had that kind of experience? There are spiritual communities that choke life out of different sorts of expressions of the life of God because they are supposed to be manifestational realities and they are manifestational realities that are different from the manifestational reality of the leader of the pack. And the pack now wants to beat everybody into his own manifestational mode. That is cloning. That is not fatherhood. That's cloning. And that's not how we will build. If we are going to build effectively, everybody must be shining their own unique colors on top of this foundation. Are you with me? Everybody must be beaming their own unique colors. Oh, all of us, we will, we will be the same. At foundation, we will be the same. We hold on to the same ideals. Our doctrinal persuasions will be the same. Are you there? Are you there? Our convictions with regards to life, with regards to morality, with regards to, uh, 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 to, to vanity, all of that will be the same. But the thing that we will use to make our mark will be different. Some persons will come with a javelin. Other people will come with a sword. Other people will come with a mattock. Some people will come with a sling. Some other people you won't even know what they are bringing. Because it's just in their breast pocket. But it's a pen. Aikoma. But the point will be all of us will stand on the same foundation. What powers the writer? Powers the warrior. What powers the warrior? Powers the accountant. What powers the accountant? Powers the apostle. What powers the apostle? Apostle also powers the architect. We operate with a wisdom that is made in heaven. You will meet a policeman and you will say, Where did you come from? He will tell you, On Christ, the solid rock I stand, like a pahade. Yes. What kind of policeman is this? Say yes. Yes. I am of the stock of Judah. Uh -uh. Who, who, who? Who? Where did you come from? He said, I am of Zion. I am of Zion. I wear the police uniform, but I'm of Zion. Is it not possible to be a Christian policeman? Yes. Yes. And at formational level, that man's ideal and your own ideal as pastor will be the same. Not this thing that, you know, all of the uh, idolatrous, uh, 
adulterers, those that still have side tricks and all, those ones, let them be doing politics, let them be doing secular job. No. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus. And the laying of that foundation, remember that the Bible says, and of his fullness have all we received. Isn't it? Of his fullness have all we received. Grace upon grace. Jesus Christ is the found and no human being, no individual Christian can manifest all of the possibilities of the Christ. That is why it's called a body. And every Christian is a member of that body. And members of the body, they have different roles. The eye is not the ear. And the mouth is not the nose. And the, and the hands are not the feet. The Bible says we are members. Different members. Different roles. But the same body. The hand does what the hand does. The eyes does what the eyes does. The ears, they do what the ears do. And it is as every member shines in their own unique calling that the body prospers. Imagine if all the body were to be eyes. You know, Paul makes that argument. That's what it is. When pastors want to force all their members to become pastors. As if anybody is serious in church, you start grooming them to become pastors. Anybody is serious, you start grooming them to become pastors. This is part of the reason why some of our people, when they go into certain positions, the truth of the matter is that they only see us as figureheads in their lives. They transfer their primary allegiance to other people. And many times, those other people lead them astray. Because the only thing we seem to show interest in are spirituals. Somebody taught this man how to do politics. Somebody taught this man how to survive in politics, whether by hook or by crook. All right? When the person even gets into, let's say even wins and goes into government, many times, many of us, we do not have the infrastructure to provide ongoing support for them manifestationally. Are you with me? Are you with me? A few years ago, we had a few states where it looked as if God was opening opportunities for Christians and all of that. And when they were ideating election, 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 there were all kinds of lofty ideas. So we're going to form a think tank, a Christian think tank. And the idea of the Christian think tank is that we will find the best economist from amongst us. Are you with me? We will find the, the best architects from amongst us. We will find the best uh, uh, policy makers from amongst us that are believers. We will form a think tank of experts in relevant fields. People that know something about mineral deposits. People that know something about how to increase the IGR of a state. People that know something about how to explore the mineral resources of a state. We have these kinds of brains amongst us. But because they are not pulpit material, many times we ignore them in church. Some of them are more solid than some of us who are on pulpit in terms of their personal work with Jesus. But because their manifestational calling is not pulpit we underrate them and we ignore them. Anyway, so the idea at that time was to create a think tank, a think tank of believers that we will now set once our person becomes governor. That will, it will be an unofficial consultative arm for the government. Pure motive, properly discipled, best interest of the state is their ambition, is their motive, that will ideate, that we brainstorm, that we come up with ideas, programs, initiatives that are the result of their expertise, their professional expertise fired by 
the Spirit of God. So that they call leaders to whom these governors respond will be able to speak and speak currently and speak relevantly and speak practically to the practical status and situation of the state at the time to say we need to get our people out of poverty. Huh? And this is what we are proposing to you. His Excellency. You know what happens many times? They don't have that kind of support. The people that give them that kind of support don't have their foundation. Are you there? But they excel in these superstructure matters because that's their thing. So what they do is they enslave our people. Sometimes they deceive them. They deceive them to compromise at the beginning. You make one compromise then they have something on you. Once they have that thing on you, they enslave you. Because now you know that they know something that they can use to rubbish you and to incriminate you. They do that early on. They do it early on. So that when they now start pushing you to do things that even you, you know are wrong, you will lose the authority, the voice to speak out because there is a way they will give you corner eye that you know that you have to behave. And then one compromise gives birth to another compromise. Gives birth to another compromise. Very soon, His Excellency, when he looks at himself, even he can no more recognize what he has become. Then we will be asked, I say, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know what happened to him. This was what happened to him. You know how they did David? That David was, David knew how terrible Joab was. But you know, he couldn't kill Joab in his lifetime. Joab oh, Joab had something on him. Ah, he said, These sons of Zeruiah. But he can't do more than that. Why? Joab had the letter that David wrote for the killing of Uriah the Hittite. It was in Joab's box. So the day that Joab will kill somebody for his own interest. He killed Amasa, right? That was more honorable than him. Without war. Ah! He killed Abner. That was coming to turn over the, 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 the kingdom unto David. Joab felt that his place as captain would be threatened if Abner comes. He killed Abner in cold blood. But the king could not talk. Why? The king had gotten him to also kill for him before. And there was a written memo to that effect. That was in Joab's possession. So when Joab now did his own atrocity, where will David have the mouth to speak? He didn't. Because he was compromised. It was on his deathbed that he told Solomon, make sure whatever you do, that was how pained David was that he couldn't meet out justice to that guy. Hey! He said, but whatever happens, make sure that that Joab does not go to the grave in peace. Let his hoary hair not go to the grave in peace because he killed two men that were more righteous than he. He killed them under your government. Why didn't you punish him? It was because the man's hands were not clean. Joab knew, Joab knew his little secrets. That's how they enslaved some of our people. In the National Assembly. At the State Houses of Assembly. That's how they enslaved some of our people. In the government house. That's how they enslaved some of our people. They just made him permanent secretary. Huh? And then some group of people will come and they say, ah, ma, yeah, since you came into this place, so we are so happy. Oh, we thank God for how God has helped you. Uh, if you need any help, because you know in this place, you can't trust everybody. And then they will come as friends. But early on, as soon as you give them a foothold in, huh? as you give them, as soon as you give them a place in, they will make sure that they compromise you so they can have something on you. Once they do, they now have what they will need to remote control you as long as you are in that office. Every compromise deepens the depth of the depth, the depth huh? of your thinking. 
And then the point will come where you practically just give up. Many times, many times, our people go into these compromising situations many times ignorantly because, it, it, they, you know, those people that you call them messengers, clerks in these government offices, hmm, hmm, they are very experienced. They call you honorable minister. They just called you from your state and they gave you appointment as minister. How do you know the first thing to do in office? There are people that have been in that civil service, in that your office. People have been there for 17 years. They know the ins and the outs of the space. They know how things move around. And so there will be a few people, they are the ruling cabals there. And if they are not believers, once you come, they will try to befriend you, compromise you. Then we, in the church, will still be praying. We say, Your Excellency, we are praying for you. Your Excellency, we are praying for you. We are praying for you. We are praying for you. So that the only thing we bring to the table at the best is the prayer that we do. The only input we make into their life is formational discipleship. There should be Christian lawyers discipling Christian lawyers. There should be Christian architects discipling Christian architects. How does a Christian architect survive the government contract landscape? Oh, do you know what it is to do government contract in this country as a believer? There are people that don't know what to do. How do you survive it and still keep your garment unspotted? Hello? The pastor may not know the details. Because that falls into the area of manifestation. And if that is not his manifestational horn, he may not have the expertise to give you all of the training that you need in that regard. The place where he absolutely does his job is formational. It is wisdom for him to know that in this assembly, I have different sons that are called to do different things. And I also have different friends that are doing those different things. And I can tell this son, uh, I, I want to connect you to this, my friend. All right? Because what you are trying to become, that's what he is. Are you there? You are my son. But your manifestational discipleship you will need to take the course from this, my friend. Or from this member of our church. Or you know, many times, pastors are also insecure. So you know me that my son, we start discussing something with somebody, they'll be talking every time, things that I am not in the picture. They will now meet and they now say, so the BOQ for that, uh, this thing, we eventually decided that if we are going to do that, we need to leverage upon the structural. And then it, it, this thing does not look like Malachi. It doesn't look like. Ah. They are now talking government. They are now talking professional talk. Meanwhile, this is supposed to be your son. Then the point will now come, you even start getting angry because maybe you now heard from your friend that uh, we, we actually went to visit the SSG. Uh, or, uh -uh. Then pastor will now start feeling like, eh? So they are already going behind my back. And they are doing meeting with the secretary to the state government on contract. And he is even now from my own friend that I'm hearing that my son is trying to do something. He, 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 This is part of the reason why our light is dulled in the public space. The foundation is what? Jesus Christ. And I want to begin to answer that question very quickly. What, what is the practical implication of that? What is it? You know, Paul, Paul, writing to the Galatians, in the first chapter of his epistle to the Galatians, help me. Now, he says, I think in the eighth verse, if anybody, 
Even if it's an angel from heaven. Where is it? Yes. Maybe read from verse 6. Let's see. Verse 6. I marvel that you are so, you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So what you are called into is the grace of Christ. But he's saying you are soon moved, removed from the one that called you unto the grace of our Lord, of, of Christ, unto another gospel. Verse 7. Which is not another. That is to say, there's actually no such thing as another gospel. It's not another in the sense that it's not another legitimate gospel. Do you get it? Do you get it? So this thing they are calling another gospel, don't think that it's also the gospel. It's just that it's another one. No. So even though he calls it another gospel, he now says, which is not another. Means it's not really gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Let's go on. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let's read on. And we said before, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Let's read on please. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by... I can't hear you loud and strong. Loud and strong. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation. Remember that's where I began from? That's why I wanted to stop over here. But as a minister of the gospel, this man had what he called revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It, this revelation of Jesus Christ means that Jesus Christ revealed things to him. That's what he means. He had the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that became the bedrock, the basis of his ministry. So it was not simply because he went to a Bible school. Hello? Now his learning was important. But Jesus Christ had to bring revelation for him. When you look at his statement in uh, First Corinthians, he talks about spirit, comparing spiritual with spiritual. In fact, he said even the language that we use, all right, God gives us the right words in order to convey his mind. So, it doesn't mean that you are not going to exert yourself. It doesn't mean you are not going to learn. It doesn't mean you are not going to, to, to train. It just simply means that none of that will qualify you if there is not a revelation. And when I'm talking about revelation, basically for easy comprehension, encounter. Just call it encounter. You need to be able to know in your heart of heart that Jesus met with you. And when I'm saying Jesus met with you, it doesn't have to be like it happened on the way to Damascus. But it cannot just be that I am doing this thing because I like it or because I know how to talk. Or, you know, it, that cannot be it. There has to be something decisive. There has to be a sense of God's calling upon your life that is, that is obvious and affirmed by the people in the community that have leadership role and oversight over your life. The call of God upon your life if you are in a community of believers cannot be hidden forever. Revelation. And so he was saying on the basis of that that if anybody preach another gospel, even if it is an angel from heaven, huh? other than the one that we have preached unto you. Now, when you read this thing in the KJV, it might be a little bit confusing. But listen to me. How is this man saying, if anybody preaches any other gospel apart from the one we have preached already, even if that person is an angel? He says, but though we are an angel from heaven. So, we are not saying that this angel, he stumbled into the assembly from hell. No. 
Even an angel from heaven. Do you know the audacity of this? To say even if it is an angel whose origin is known and established as heaven. Even an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that preached, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cause to say that the gospel we've given to you, even if an angel, even if an angel comes and is not giving you a contrary teaching, that's this order that you are saying there, is contradiction. Even the angel should be a cost. How much more immortal? So you want to say, Paul, what, who are you? Uh-uh. Do you know everything that there is to know? How can you say if somebody comes and they teach something other than the one you have taught already? And he is, in that is including himself. He said, whether we are the one or even if it's, it is an angel. To say that if I come back tomorrow and I say, eh, 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 and I change mouth. Let me be accursed. I don't have time to tease out all of the implications, the apostolic implications of that. But hear this, hear this. What the man is saying is not that. He knows everything that there is to know. But what the man is saying is that every correct thing that there is to know that he does not know will not contradict what he already knows. That is a word other, other. That other in the KJV, I said it's shrouded. It means contrary, contrary. So you may come and say something that Paul has never said before. No problem. The problem will be when the thing you are saying is contrary to what they have established before, eh, then you are in problem. So we are not saying we know everything there is to know. No, no. But the book of Jude is very clear. When he says, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but it became impressed upon me to write to you to earnestly contend for the faith. All right? Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's the point. That this thing was once delivered. There, there is no innovation. The content of the gospel cannot change. Doesn't matter how many years have passed. It does not matter how many encounters you have had with God. It, it, it means that it, it was delivered to us once and for all. Once delivered. There are so, oh, but revelation is progressive, yes. And I taught you that before. Revelation is progressive does not mean revelation is contradictory. Huh? It, it, it just simply means that when God says more, we will know more. But nothing that God says will contradict what God already said. That's the idea. And the body of truth that we need for salvation has been delivered completely, wholesale already. Anything contrary to it is wrong. Ab initio. From the start is wrong. So we can judge a man's ministry on the basis of what has been delivered once and for all. It's not because we are claiming that we know everything. No. You may, you, God may show you light about salvation and uh, the gospel from a passage of scripture in a way that I haven't seen it before. But the point is that the point in the, in the thing you are saying cannot contradict the thing we already know that has been said by scripture. The idea here is contradiction. We are not saying that, oh, hey, are you not saying that everybody who is preaching salvation must only use John chapter 3 verse 16? No, that's not what we are saying. We are simply saying that no matter the passage that you are using, the point, the substance of the point that you are making cannot contradict the thing that is explicitly taught already in scripture. This body of knowledge, of truth has been once delivered to the saints. 
There is nothing new in the sense of different that God is saying today about the gospel anymore. Did you hear what I said? I said there is nothing new in the sense of different. There's nothing new in the sense of being different that God is saying today about the reality of salvation, the matter of salvation is being delivered once and for all to the sin. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles of the Holy Ghost with them. God bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. This thing is established, is cast in stone. Ladies and gentlemen, the content of our, our labor, our exercise in foundation lane is not fluid. Hello? It's not fluid. We don't come at you to say, well, if that's the one God gave you, do your own. Eh? If God told you that we need to add salt and water and bait in order for us to be established in the faith, why are you disturbing other people? Hello? Somebody woke up the other day and said, God sent him keys from heaven. Ilakwatai. Pai. Tai. And, 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 and people and people still patronize that shrine. And then if we talk, you say, face your own. Face the one they gave you. Face the one they gave you. Do you know what God told him? Do you know where he met God? You are an embarrassment to the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, even if it is an angel from heaven. Are you with me? Are you with me? Even if it is an angel from heaven that comes with any other gospel that is different from the one already delivered to you. Let him be accursed. Paul was basically saying, including myself, if I come tomorrow and I want to change the goalpost, huh? blacklist me, anathemize me, whether we or an angel, from heaven. Not a messenger of Satan. An angel from heaven. So who is your papa? Who is your papa? Because when we talk, you will say face your own. Face your own. No. There is such a thing as contending earnestly for the faith that was once delivered. There are things that we cannot innovate on. Certain matters are too rigid. They are cast in stone. They do not admit revision. And it is the responsibility of certain persons to stand and say, we form the last line. Huh? We form the last line in the course of the advance of error. When you hit this line, when you hit this line, you will die here. Hello? We, you cannot bridge the wall that we form. There has to be people standing on Zion's wall crying out to say, ah! What of the night? Oh, watchman, what of the night? There has to be people warning the city that there is a company coming from afar and they are not friends. There has to be people giving warning to those within the city that an enemy is approaching our camp. There has to be people on the wall of Zion that God has given the responsibility of sight and of vision to be able to see and to warn those that are within the city of refuge that a bridge is about to be occasioned. That trespass is being planned against our camp. And it is, and it is not, and it is, it is a ministry. It is the calling. It is the grace of God upon the life of a man. So when the people you are trying to help 
They begin to cry. Ask, Why? Do you know what he's bringing? Do you know what God told him? Do you know how God sent him? No. No. The same standard we erect, use it against us. That's what Paul is saying. Judge us by the same standard. If it's an angel from heaven, judge the angel by the same standard. And so, in that book, by the time you get to the fourth chapter, in the 17th verse, I'm following. As I try to wrap up, in the 17th verse of the fourth chapter of Galatians, of his epistle to the Galatians, he's saying, maybe the this, this, this 16th chapter, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? There are these people that zealously affect you. Maybe when I come back, if I have an, uh, an opportunity, we'll continue from here. There are people that zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that they might, that you might affect them. This KJV language is, is too, it's confusing. Huh? They zealously cut you. You know when you are, you know courtship? You know courtship? That's the language here. They try to befriend you. Alright? They caught you. But for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. So, they, are, they, they form an exclusion party within the church. So, they come and try to court some people, to woo some people, to befriend some people. And the idea is to yank them out of the community. It's sectarian. Huh? so that you will become their super fans. It is those people are zealous to win you over for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. Did you say it there now? Yes, that was that language in the KJV. Huh? They are zealous to win you over, not to Jesus. They want to win you over from this community of faith. And it is not for good that they want to win you over. What they want, I'm reading the Bible, what they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. They are trying to form a fans club out of you. They want to yank you away from the way you are rooted in the gospel. All right? So they come with these pernicious statements. They come with this high-sounding nonsense. They come with this innovative preaching so as to create a difference and advance themselves and commend themselves to you and then exclude you from us. Are you there? Alienate you from us. You say, ah, I have been in this place for this long. Hey, until suddenly... I heard the, the thing, ah, what that man is saying. And I know why people don't like him. And I know why people don't like him. And I know why people don't like him. The Bible said that the reason they are zealous to win you over is not for good. Their intent is to alienate you from us. The true community of faith. So that you may be zeal. You may have zeal for them. Is an ambition. It's a personal desire. There is a hunger in their heart. It is self. It is flesh. It is vanity. It is ego. They are zealous to win you over. And that's why they look for things that will appeal to you. When they are zealous to win another group over, they will look for things that will appeal to them. In fact, sometimes they might even come and speak well of your geo. Hey, they will put, they will put that they are boy on the platform and talk good, 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 good about him. It's called name dropping. Those are the shenanigans of modern apostles. It's name dropping. And they are name dropping so that they can wet your heart. They can, they can, they can break down your resistance. Uh, hello, they can destroy any hesitation that you have because uh -uh, if you are a winner and somebody likes a de, uh, and somebody likes Oye oh, Depo like this, who is not a member of Winners Church, he's an apostle, he's preaching the gospel, and when you hear the way he says all oh, these beautiful, wonderful things about Oye oh, Depo, and you are members of Winners, you know you will start to develop a small liking for him because somebody that likes your papa, you should also like the person, isn't it? 
That's why many of them are doing this thing they are doing about. When, when I told you earlier on that you, if you see gold today and you see hey today, you will not know the difference yet. Many of you thought I was joking. The intent of the heart, the unseen matters of motive, they are the things that imbue your work with its quality. Some of the people name dropping and calling your papas and calling your fathers in the Lord. They don't like them. All they are trying to do is to alienate you. Huh? They, they, they say, even if it's 0.1%, you can get out of winners. And you get another 0.01% out of redeem. So, any, when, when they are talking naturally, they will build Baba Deboye into it. How he did this and the way God, he, such a one. He, you know, they say all those beautiful things. It, time that people should use to study scripture and teach the Bible. They have, they have become concealed politicians. And many times when they come on pulpit, what they are doing is campaign. They are campaigning for themselves. But you are not aware because they don't use their names. They are trying to alienate you. Alienate you. Alienate you so that you can become zealous for them. So any day that somebody say, hey, look at what this person said. What, what do you think will happen to you? You will stand up as part of the Defenders Club. You say, ah, this man that like our papa, is it him they are talking about like that on social media? Bah, 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 bah. You will take to your keypad. Eh? And, and you are defending something that you know nothing about. I want to see you. Oh God. I want to see you. There's a vision of God that will rid your heart of corruption and vanity. When nothing but Jesus matters, that the only merchandise you bring to the market will be the Lord Jesus. That your labor will be to entrench Jesus into the foundation of the lives of men and women. Give me the next verse. Zealously affected but not for good. Their goal is to exclude you. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. Next verse. My little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. It means that my former travail was for the formation of Christ in you. This current travel is for the same thing. It, because that is the foundation. If anything happens to it, we need to revisit it. I am traveling again as in birth until Christ be formed in you. Why did I come here? It is because other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. So this man says his labor is to labor so that Christ can be formed in the Galatians. Next verse. Of whom I labor until uh, travel again as in bed until Christ is formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Because their foundation in Christ was appearing compromised on the basis of the behavior that Apostle Paul had noticed with regards to their body language towards legalism or Judaism. Are you with me? For the Galatians, it was Judaism. Mixing the law, the requirement of the law, and the requirement of grace. That was it. That is it by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you, people are beginning to mix these things up. Having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? That was the problem he had with them. And every generation has its own perversion. Every generation has what? Has its own perversion. And it is the duty of the watchmen of Zion. It is a duty of the leaders, the ministers, to identify the perversion of every generation, of every dispensation, if you like, or every civilization, and to bring the corrective in the Christ. Paul said, I travail again as in birth until Christ is formed in you. I'm beginning to answer that question if 
You want to lay Christ Jesus as the foundation? What does that look like? And we are beginning to see here. Paul said, there is a travail. There is a labor that needs to be engaged in order for Christ to be formed in, in a people. And he's saying to believers, believers, I travail again as if I am in childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So we need to look at the practical implication of that process and what are the indicators that Christ is being formed. Because if we are going to build what will last, it must be founded upon the right foundation and that foundation is Christ Jesus so that when the rains come and the storm beat on it and the wind blow at it, the house will still be standing. Why? Because it has been founded upon a rock. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. I want to see you. Oh God. I want to see you. I want to see your face. Hmm. I want to know your ways. I want to touch your grace so I can live your days. I want to see you. Oh God, I I want to see your face. I want to know your ways. I want to touch so Oh God I want to see your face I want to know your way and I want to touch so I want to see you oh God oh yes I want to know your ways. I want to touch your grace so I can be your I want to see you. Oh Lord, I want to see you. One more time. I want to see your face. So much noise everywhere. But I, I want to see you. See you. See you. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you. See you. to see you oh god yes i want to see you see you see you yes i want to see you 